Welcome in, builders. We are going to take a look at Abyssia, Children of Flame, this week. This is a nation that's kind of like my comfort food for Dominions. When we start a new Dominions game, this is usually the first nation I play just to check it out. Uh, this time around, they didn't really see tons of changes between 5 and 6, but that doesn't make them any less of a nation. Abyssia struggles a little bit as being kind of a one-trick pony, but it does its tricks very well and it gives you room for taking advantage of other opportunities that you find, like other types of mages, or other independents, or using different types of magic than you would normally want to use on most nations. So, very cool nation here. I would say it's a contender, actually, for a very new player friendly nation. It does have some Astral and Blood on these Warlock units, but it is totally playable even if you just ignored those units. And it's even better when you can utilize them. So a nation you could start with and grow into very easily, or just a fun nation if you know what you're doing, because it's it's kind of straightforward, but like I said, at the same time, has some neat things it can do. Let's start by taking a look at the lore behind Abyssia. Abyssia is a hot wasteland, at the center of which lies a great volcano whose lava-lit caverns are inhabited by magma-born humanoids. Their flesh radiates heat, and they are not harmed by flames. Abyssians are stronger than humans, and use very heavy armor and weaponry. Bows are not used as they would burn to cinders in the glowing hands of the Abyssians. The war machine of Abyssia also includes salamanders, lizard-like beings composed of the same hot lava-born flesh as the Abyssians. The anointed of Ro and the animathent priests of the flame cult are practiced blood sacrifice to strengthen the power of the awakening god. The warlocks of the Smolder Cone a newly formed magical order, practice blood magic, and search for suitable blood slaves in conquered lands. Abyssians prefer to live in extremely hot places. They do not farm or hunt for a living, so their income and supplies are not affected by the growth and death scales of a province. However, population will still die slowly in Abyssian-controlled provinces with death scales. So this is kind of an oddball in Dominions in that I don't think there's very many direct mythological or religious inspirations here. This is kind of a, a fantasy race. They're pretty cool. They really, really like heat. As a race, they radiate heat, meaning we have like a heat aura. We have very high flame resistance. We actually prefer heat scales plus three. So higher heat than you can normally get on a nation is what we're comfortable with. We come with Wasteland Survival. Death and growth scales have half the standard effect on income and population growth and no effect on supplies. We get extra gold and resources in cave forts. So this is one of the areas where Dominion 6 is a buff to Abyssia. We can start underground, and we would sure like to, because it is noticeable how much extra income and resources you will get in a cave fort. With these changes to heat scales and death and growth scales, it also means that this is a nation that doesn't follow kind of the normal pattern of most nations. We'll see down here below, forts re reduce heat scale deaths by two steps. So we could go very high heat and death, and actually not suffer too much for it. That's pretty unique among most nations. And that is going to open up a lot of different ways you could do your scales. As for military, we have very heavy infantry, and I actually agree with this assessment for this nation. We have no missiles, and we have salamanders. For magic, we have very strong fire, we have good blood, we have limited astral and limited earth. Our priests are powerful. We go all the way up to a Holy 3, a Holy 2, and we have a Holy 1. So we have the whole gambit there. Having recruitable Holy 3s, even if they're slow to recruit, is very handy. That means you can either go for an immobile pretender or a god that you don't want to have getting into combat. You can rush multiple thrones at once. All the benefits of having those Holy 3s. Uh, at, when we look at our sacred unit, our sacred units are a little hard to bless, so it is pretty nice to have a Holy Three that can get them all blessed easily, rather than trying to have a bunch of priests spot buff uh, smaller blesses. 
Our priests also can perform blood sacrifices, and we do have blood mages, so if we are inclined to do so, we can search up some blood slaves and use them for extra temple checks. We quite like being in our heat. Um, we have, on most of our troops, relatively high encumbrance. We do not need to be taking extra encumbrance for fighting in the wrong heat, if at all possible. So we're going to want to push our Dominion out. Our Dominion is, depending on how you design your scales, not very harmful to us, but they're kind of painful for other people. So it's one of those nations that you can kind of push that out in front of you to make their lives a little more miserable and, and weaken them up for conquest. So very nice there. Scales and Blesses, as mentioned, we have a heat limit plus two. That means you can go all the way to heat four when you're picking your scales. Extra death limit, so we can go to death three. And we just get uh, two free bless points. Um, I'm honestly not even sure why they get that. I think it's because we are, as mentioned a couple times, very one-trick ponies. We do fire. We do a bit of blood. So it's kind of predictable what we're going to be able to do and so having a couple extra bless points means that maybe we could throw something into our bless a little surprising or just get our bless cheaper so we can go even higher scales for buildings we get standard forts so for us that is going to be the palisade and then the fort but remember our forts reduce heat scale deaths by two steps so that means if your heat scale was four i believe it acts as if it's heat two so very, very powerful there. You're going to want to build forts on provinces that have good income and protect that income with your forts, although we are pretty unaffected by many of the things that would normally affect that. Let's go ahead and start in with our units here. We really only have a couple of units. We have two-handers and one-hander in shields, starting with the First one, we have a battle axe, which is a length two two-handed weapon, 11 attack and 25 damage. Now, normally two-handed weapons are kind of eh, because they're often wielded by barbarians who are not wearing great armor. However, we do not have that problem. We have 17 protection, and this is true 17 protection because we are not wielding a shield here. So most troops are already going to struggle to get through that armor. So if you're in a situation where you need to hit something really hard, very, very few things are going to get a prop value up into 25s. These guys will hack them apart. So very, very strong unit here. Uh, you're going to see the same traits across most of these units. So we have fire resistance 25. That makes us nigh immune to any battlefield fire magic or heat effects that you'd like to throw around. So Rex will not be able to throw a falling fire into our troop line and kill a whole bunch. We're going to shrug it off. We don't even care. We like fighting in the, in the fire. Our troops also have a heat aura. This has been nerfed down from Dominions 5. In Dom 5, your heat auras would stack, meaning they would take more and more fatigue damage the more auras you had. In Dom 6, the effect does not stack, but the size of the aura does. So having lots of heat auras together just makes the heat aura larger, not more efficient. That being said, uh, it's, it's decent. Uh, I often don't see people fully fatigue out from a heat aura, but every little bit helps. So most of our troops will have that, and it's just a little bit of extra fatigue for things around us. If you had things that were fire weak, I believe they would take extra fatigue from that, so it might be relevant somewhere. Next up, we have Wasteland Survival. This is actually pretty important for us because we're probably gonna we're, we're gonna run heat and we're probably gonna run death scales. So there's a decent chance that if you had bad provinces near you at the start of the game anyways, they might be turning into a wasteland. And we're actually kind of interested in casting a ritual spell, a global one called Second Sun, which makes the world very hot and starts transforming it into wastelands. If a game came to that point, because we would have wasteland survival, we wouldn't uh, have the, a need of supplies. So everyone else would just be starving to death and we're going to be totally fine. So a very powerful uh, late game option if it ever comes to it. And finally, we have Dark Vision. We only have 50, so we're not fully seeing the dark. We still take a little bit of penalty, but everyone else who doesn't have any will take the full penalty. So not the worst thing ever for us. 
as mentioned, we can start underground, and this allows us to fight down there. Although it does it does hurt a bit that we don't have full dark vision, unfortunately. Otherwise, we're wearing a plate halberd and an iron cap, 18 and 16 uh, protection, respectively. Note our low defense skill. That's going to be kind of a theme across most of our troops. Next up is the same troop, except for he's wielding a flail. Flails are a great weapon. If you don't need that 25 damage, the flail is better because it gives you two attacks per troop. We are only size three as a race. So that means that we can have six attacks going out from a single square of these guys. We also get a plus two to attack if the unit we're attacking has a shield. Very strong there. And it's still length two. So you could even get some repels on short length zero or one weapons and give yourself a little bit of defense that way. Note our defense is even lower on this unit, but our protection is just as good. So if you don't need the axe, I think I would go with flails, generally speaking. Next up, we have the second variety of our troops. This is the same chassis, except for he's training out a two-handed weapon for a tower shield. Very good shield. Uh, protection 16 on it. Uh, you'll note our, our defense looks like it's really good, but a lot of that's coming from uh, our shield parry. Axe is an axe, so only 10 attack. Still does 21 damage, though. Perfectly usable. And we also have a Morningstar variety, which gets the plus 2 attack versus shielded. So if you're fighting things that have shields, I would probably go Morningstar. If you're not, the axe is probably better. The Morningstar also has just one more attack than the axe does anyways. So if going from 10 to 11 feels pertinent to you, maybe you'd use flails even against things that don't have shields. These also have a 50% uh, piercing chance. So you'd roll either blunt or piercing. So it can help you get through thicker armor a little bit if that also is relevant. Next up, we have misspread. These are a cap only unit. Very interesting here. Uh, they are part undead demon, so you do need to have undead slash demon leadership to move them around. They wield a, the same battle axe that our troops do. They're size four because they have big wings. They have many of the other things. So we have our fire resistance. We have our heat aura. However, they're flying. They're stealthy. These guys are pretty good. Um, their morale looks high, but I tend to find they have morale problems because you usually don't have a ton of them. They also tend to have afflictions when they're spawned in. They're called misspreads because they're like uh, crossbreeding accidents. Like these didn't turn out too well, but we're still going to use them anyways. They also can come in as old age sometimes. So they have a lot of problems there. That being said, Having a flying battle axe can be quite the surprise for people who are used to your very heavy armor, front row, grind combat. Ten of these guys flying into the back will get some kills. Now, whether they kill what you want or not, eh, it is what it is. Note they have really low encumbrance, so unless their afflictions mess that up, they won't tire themselves out in that fight. So, very handy. Unfortunately, cap only. It'd be very nice if they weren't. Next up, we have the Salamander that's been mentioned a couple times. They have our Fire Resist. They have an even hotter Fire Aura. They have the same Wasteland Survival. They are, however, animals and undisciplined. But they have Fire Power. So Fire Power gives us extra stats based on the heat scales of province. I believe it is Strength, Attack, and Protection, I believe, for those stats. And quite, quite good. In fact, I might be able to check that on... Do we have somebody down here? Yeah, so these guys are getting their heat 5, because that's the heat of this area. We're getting no difference on our defense skill. We are getting the bonus on our strength and not on our protection. So strength and attack are the main two bonuses from that. Very powerful if you're in the heat, and you're going to want to be in heat anyways. So no worries there. The nice thing about these guys is their Fire Flare attack. It is a length 0, attack 10. However, it is area of effect 1. So they basically run up and they just burst into flames, essentially. Very high fatigue cost. So you're only going to get a couple of them off before you fatigue out. However, deleting an entire square at a time is very, very nice. And it helps you a lot against things that 
might otherwise cause you problems. You don't care about glamour if you just burn the entire square. Uh, you don't care that there's a whole bunch of like size one bugs that you have to chew through slowly. You just burn them all. So very nice to have an AOE attack uh, unit that we can uh, recruit from any of our forts. So it can be quite good. Uh, he pairs up with our beast trainer who is a beast master plus three. So he helps their morale quite a bit. So their low-ish morale actually isn't as bad as it looks. It's like a 12. Finally, we have our sacred unit, the burning one. This is a pretty good sacred unit. I wouldn't say it is top, top tier, but I would say it's on the good side. Fire resist that we have, the higher heat aura like the salamander. So heat aura six is pretty noticeable. They have a native fire shield for eight armor piercing damage. That is a good fire shield. So anybody poking at them will have to try to get through that or start taking damage. They have Berserk plus three, which is pretty high. Our defense is garbage anyway, so we're not lamenting the fact that we're going to lose defense when we go Berserk. We'll take the extra protection. We'll take the extra strength and attack skill. We already have good attack skill. We have the Wasteland Survival, the Dark Vision the same firepower as the salamander have so our strength and attack will be even higher when we're in areas where it's hot we have ambidextrous ambidextrous essentially lowers the penalty for dual wielding and it works based on the length of what you're dual wielding essentially with the one that we have we're not taking any penalty to our weapons we are wielding the morning stars which mean we get an additional plus two attack versus shielded units so this is a 15 attack against shielded things for 22 damage, not taking into account firepower, not taking into account berserk. So very, very hard hitting. We're very tall units. We're, we're size four and we have a length one weapon. So there's decent chance that we hit people in the head with this. So the blunt uh, bonus of, hit, of head hits doing more damage can take effect. We also have a chance for doing piercing damage so that can help us get through highly armored targets. But with 22 base damage and it can only go up with our other features we're not going to struggle to get through heavy armor in very many circumstances now the downside they have bad formation fighter minus two that essentially means they act as if they are two sizes larger so they act as if they're a size six that means you're only going to have one in a square now you can filter in your normal infantry troops in with them so you'd have a normal guy plus one of these which is fine but it also means that they're going to be very spread out. You're going to have one per square, and it's going to be hard to bless them. So having those holy threes really helps. Even a holy two for the slightly increased bless size can help. And these guys are definitely worth a decent bless. They're so survivable that unless you fight very specific things like giants that can really like squish into them, and they're not, you know, 23 HP is totally fine. You'll tend to build up a pretty good amount of these. They're very hard for many things to kill. And depending on your bless, you can make them much, much more solid. So when we get to talking about blesses, we'll come back to these guys. But their, their weaknesses are they're low density because they can only have one per square. And they do have high encumbrance. So they're going to tire themselves out quite a bit. Because remember, you're going to be... You're going to want these guys in there in the blender, plus having the Berserk's going to do that. So very solid unit, worth a bless, good sacred. Next up, let's take a look at commanders. First up, we have our scout slash assassin. So this is a recruit in any fort assassin. He is an Abyssian, so we get our standard Abyssian traits. He is an assassin one. Uh, the higher your assassin skill, the more quote unquote patient you are, which lowers the chances of there being bodyguards, even if they are assigned. So we're just the basic assassin, nothing special there. We have really high ambidextrous, so we're not taking any penalty on our weapons. You could also, because it is ambidextrous three, you could maybe give him longer weapons if for some reason there was something you wanted him to wield instead. Um, maybe you have a very specific target you're trying to assassinate and there's a weapon that would counter that really well. Uh, he, otherwise, he has decent protection, decent defense skill. So he often can actually win against like a bodyguard or two and still get his kill. So very solid unit. You can use these guys in small groups to try to kill all the leadership in a province before attacking it. 
which means all the troops on the field would just auto retreat because they'd have no leadership. Uh, in the right circumstances, that can be very powerful. So very nice that we have assassins. Great for killing off enemy mages. If they're running around with one or two mages, maybe like blessing their troops, wipe those out before a fight, and then they wouldn't have their bless they were expecting, et cetera, et cetera. Very good to have an assassin. Next up, we have our beast trainer. We touched on him. You'd get him basically to lead salamanders or maybe you've summoned something. Uh, of note, when you're doing other types of summons, if they don't have fire resist, all of our troops have that heat aura. And our, our friendly troops will be in it too, most likely. So you're going to need to think about giving them fire protection or sending them off to die before the main battle happens, perhaps. But yeah, so maybe not as useful as maybe a beast tamer would be on some other nations that might like having animal chaff, but usable, good for salamanders if you're using them. Next up, we have our commander unit, the warlord. He's pretty good. He's dual wielding axes at 12 attack for 23 damage. That's pretty solid. He is he has a helmet, he has armor, 18 protection is very good. Uh, note that is all armor, so if you gave him some buffs, that would go up a little bit more. He has very low defense skill. He is a taskmaster. So if if you got something that was enslaved, I'm trying to think. I don't think we have anything that would be a slave, but if somehow you ended up with something. Uh, an independent that was a slave or something, he could totally lead them for some extra bonus. He's a good leader. He's not too expensive. I mean, 110 for 100 leadership is fine. A little high on resources. He's pretty good. Uh, if you're worried about him getting killed, throwing a shield on him would probably be what I would give him. Uh, otherwise, he's actually pretty good at defending himself. I like to give them a bodyguard or two so they can't get completely surrounded, but they can hold their own. Things will flank around and he'll just kill them. He don't care. He's actually happy to have something to do in the back. So very, very solid leader here with a clear upgrade path of giving him a shield, I think would make him even more survivable. Next up, we have our fire mages. These first two can be recruited from any of our forts. They are sacred mages, so you will also need a temple. They also benefit from having the reduced upkeep for being sacred. The Anathemat Salamander is a Fire 2 Holy 1. Uh, this is a decent unit. Fire 2 is very solid. You can Phoenix Pyre up to Fire 3 and cast plenty of very fun fire spells out. We have our standard other traits with a higher heat aura. Note that they have no protection. So I don't know if I would want to craft items for every single one of these guys, but perhaps adding a little defense in your Bless would be much appreciated by these guys, just to make sure you don't take a stray arrow and die, because they're not cheap. 245 is a pretty expensive mage. They do have a little bit of magical leadership, but of note, they do not have undead leadership. So they can't move around demons being the main thing here. So, okay, mage. Next up, we have the Anathemet Dragon. This is a very similar mage. He goes up one in fire. He gains a earth and becomes a holy two. Very pricey, 365 gold. Still have just 12 HP. Note he is probably going to be old age. You could take a bless to try to counter that. I don't know if that's worth it, frankly. We have other things we'd prefer to be using our bless points for, but it's there. I don't think these are a guaranteed old age, but I also don't even know if that blessing would get them down. So you might have to take half dead, which lowers your chances of taking diseases and afflictions for being old. But again, I don't know if that's worth it. These guys are recruit in any of our forts, so it's not like they're a cap only old mage. Of note, Earth 1 is kind of an icky point. You can buff yourself with a defensive spell, so that would take care of your protection, but you can't Earth power, and you can't get out the big Earth buffs. So if you're going into a major fight, like a decisive battle, maybe give them an Earth Gem so that they can earth, summon Earth power. That takes them to Earth 2. They could do some more buffing, but more importantly with Earth power, that will help their encumbrance well, their fatigue, so they can recoup faster. Uh, you're paying a lot for this unit because he is sacred too, and you, you have a path that, other than our special national spell, you probably wouldn't use too much. So he's pretty pricey for what he does, but you'll probably still want him because they're decent mages. 
next up we have the demon bread this is a capital only uh, he is an assassin, not a leader of the Mistbreds, like you might be thinking. Uh, he is the better assassin because he is flying. Uh, so you can fly right over whatever bodyguards might charge you at the beginning of the fight. He's also Assassin Zero, so he's very impatient. He just wants to get in there. Uh, he does hit harder. He has higher attack. But he's cap only, and that... That really hurts him because we'd prefer our caps doing other things. But that being said, a couple of these guys, because they fly, they can get to where you need them to be very quickly. They're only one recruitment point, so you could grab two of them in a round. They have their uses. I don't find myself recruiting them very often. Next up, we have two, well, we have three more cap only mages. I think I'm going to start with the Anointed of Row. This is our biggest fire mage, and he is an big fire mage this is an early era mage four fire one earth holy three he does have a 10 percent chance of getting fire earth astral or blood especially for astral or blood if you did get one of those treat him very carefully because you could get him into a communion or a sabbath that could be quite quite good that being said four fire is enough to build the fire booster so you could be fire five and you could phoenix power up to fire six you can cast anything on the battlefield you really would like to do he's also our holy three unit so he can claim thrones do divine blessing very powerful there he is slow to recruit he requires four recruitment points so one every other turn he has firepower two i don't know what you would be doing that you'd care about those kind of stats but it's there i don't think he is worth thugging even with the firepower, he's just so expensive. 630 gold is a big investment and two cap turns. Uh, that being said, he has an amazing fire shield. He has a 13 heat aura. I, that's maybe the highest in the game, or if not, it's very close. Very strong mage. You're going to want a few of these. Probably one per big army so that you can divine bless all of your burning ones. And you can get your big battlefield-wide fire stuff out with uh, items or empowering. He also can do some of our big rituals or global spells. So a very important mage that you probably won't get too many of. Next up, we have kind of an oddball here for a nation. We have the Warlock Apprentice, who is a cap-only mage. He's just a blood one. He's just a little blood one guy. But... He's our efficient researcher. He is only 60 gold per year for seven research. A great uh, mage to uh, have some crafted items on that will increase his research. Very, very good. But the balance is he's cap only. Now note, he's not sacred. So if you're trying to get your burning ones out in the early game, you can go up to your dom worth of those and then still grab a mage to research. I tend to find that I don't get too many of these guys, and as the game goes on, I stop recruiting them because I'd rather spend my cap turns on other cap-only things. But they're they're decent. Some early blood uh, hunting. Maybe you get just a few blood slaves to do something specific, or just these are your efficient researchers, or you just can't afford any other mage because you're trying to get troops out to expand. Our troops in general are very resource-intensive, and not recruitment point in intensive. So you're going to have a lot of resources required and a decent amount of gold. So you're going to often find yourselves out of resources and out of gold. So this is your cheapest option to recruit something that can research. Next up, we have our Warlock. He is an Astral Blood 2 with a random 10% Fire, Earth, Astral, and Blood. Very, very important unit for us. Um, Blood 2 is enough for our Infernal Crossbreeding. That's a national spell we'll talk about later, but very powerful. If your god's not doing it, you're going to have these guys doing it. Uh, in Dom 6, Blood 2 plus a uh, Sanguine Dousing Rod is your most efficient blood hunting person. That's going to be these guys. They have your standard Abyssian traits, and they also have Adept Crossbreeder which gives you better results from your crossbreeding uh, rituals. So very, very good. As for who to make your profit, I generally use a warlord. 
The Warlord is tough enough that you're probably not going to lose him in this test game in the background here. I never lost him. And as usual, I didn't do anything like kick gloves to keep him alive. He was there fighting the whole game, leading one of my main armies the whole game. Did just fine. Uh, it's nice to have a survivable chassis. This is a nation, though, that, I mean, a demon bread, maybe? He would be flying, which would give you a lot more mobility. Uh, he is stealthy, so you could do stealthy preaching things, etc., etc. So that might be an option if you're so inclined. Maybe your first prophet dies and you have to grab another one. Maybe you use one of these. I don't think I would probably chance trying to assassinate people with my prophet. But even there, you'll probably end up with a decent uh, holy spell offensive one. Maybe it's worthwhile to uh, do that. Uh, you'd also be able to clear out Summoned Undead that a lot of mages like to spam at you during assassinations. So, I don't know, some, something interesting there. You'd probably have to give him a little bit of gear if you were going to do that. But I think those are your main two. You might consider an Anointed of Row. That would take him up to a Holy Four so you could do Fanaticism. We don't really struggle with morale, though, so I don't think the benefit of that is too high on this nation. However, it would cut down his 252 gold per year upkeep to zero. So you'd get one of those for free. That being said, after the early game, I haven't had any money problems on this nation, so I wouldn't concern myself too much with that. Especially in the early game, you cannot afford two turns of cap plus 630 gold, so that would be more of a replacement for later in the game. As for national items, we have no national items. As for national spells, we have a good smattering of them. Uh, first one I want to look at here is under Blood Magic. At only Blood 3, which is very achievable in the early game, we have Infernal Breeding. This is very similar to Cross Breeding, however you do not need the Nature Magic. Instead you only need Blood 2. Blood 2 is on all of our Warlocks, so even if your god was not designed for this, you have a unit that can totally do it. It does give you more effects the higher your blood is. So if you took a high blood god or uh, in some way achieve that, you'll get more out of it. Essentially, we trade 25 blood slaves for a roll of random units. And we can actually see that in our national overview. All the units from this Hellbred Giant down are all different outcomes from Infernal Breeding. So for example, this is your cream of the crop unit. If you trade 25 blood slaves for a unit of, let's say, 10 of these guys plus a commander, you're going to be very happy about that. 20 protection, he's a giant with two attacks, a length three battle axe, very powerful. And you have various different amounts of usefulness, like the Hellbred Horite, much less impressive, eight attack, he does have some resists, kind of whatever. Uh, these guys, we've got some venomous fangs and a fist, kind of whatever. But there's there's some really good ones. These guys, they're wearing uh, Point Hallberg. They have three different kinds of attacks. Pretty dang good. So Infernal Breeding is a very efficient use of Blood Slaves. Very worthwhile doing. Almost all of these are of use of some sort. That's probably the worst one. Everyone else you would be really happy with. So a very, very good national spell on that one. Next up, I want to look at Conjuration at Conj 2. We have Summon Spectral Infantry. So that is a Fire Death Cross Path. We do not have that natively. However, you could empower somebody to do that, or maybe your god can do it. For five Death Gems, uh, we get seven of them. This is the Smolder Ghost. So five Death Gems for seven of these. Very nice spell. Very efficient. Only 15 HP, but they have, they're have they Ethereal. And they're wielding a Spectral Axe, which deals eight magic damage. And it has Spectral Fire, which is fire magic for eight more. That's armor piercing. It's also a magic resist check to negate it. So a very good weapon. Uh, these guys are totally, totally usable. I believe in some of the later ages of Abyssia, they actually become sacred. But for us, they are not. But if you have the chance to use that, I think this is a totally usable uh, national spell. We also have Scorpion Man. Uh, this one's harder. It's a fire-earth cross path required to summon it. Uh, 
it's Conjuration 8. You probably will not get there because you have other high uh, schools that you would prefer. If you went to late game, you're looking at like Second Son, probably. You're not, you're probably not going all the way up Conjuration, but if for some reason you did, these guys are pretty good. They are sacred for us. They do have fear in practical use, so you're never going to get here. We also have Great Lions because of course we do. That is a nature summon. We don't natively have nature. If you get nature, you're probably looking at other things to do with it that are not dumb lions that don't have fire resist. I don't think you would ever use those, unfortunately. Next up in alteration at alt six, we have hellscape. Notable that it is only four fire, so our anointeds can all cast this out of the box. 10 fire gems is not an expensive spell. This lets us at range five hit a province with plus three heat scales, plus one death scale, minus 10% population, and add some unrest. So a very handy spell. So if you're having to fight in the cold, you need to be throwing this in front of your army so that you can heat it up. So at least you're at like neutral and not all the way into cold. Maybe you even throw a couple of these to try to really pump that heat scale up for your, your units to be in there. Uh, could be used if you're in range of an enemy capital to just pummel them with this, killing off their pop, raising their unrest, screwing their income. Very good spell, very castable for us. We have five fire gem income from our capital, so 10 is nothing. You'll, you'll always have plenty of fire gems available. Next up in evocation, we have a national spell. So Liquid Flames of Row, again, three fire, one earth. So both our Anointed can do it and our Middle Mage can do it. He will need to Phoenix Pyre, I believe. Actually, no, he can natively cast that, but Phoenix Pyre will make it more efficient. This is a good spell. Range 30 plus, so the higher fire gives you a little more range. It's fast casting, it's area of effect one. It does, it's only 20 fatigue and we have mages that can get to four or even five fire easily. So you're looking at 10 fatigue, five fatigue, very, very low fatigue. And it does fire magic damage at 24 plus armor piercing damage and extra effect splash of molten metal area of effect six armor piercing fire magic damage. And it leaves a lingering cloud. This is a very powerful spell. When you get this and you've got three, four, five mages tossing this, because everyone but our weakest little fire mage can do this easily, it is very nice. It will just delete squares. Uh, the competition to this would be Falling Fire. Uh, I think this is a better spell than Falling Fire. Note armor piercing here, armor piercing here, and leaves a cloud. If we're looking at Falling Fire, which we would unlock at five also, a little bit bigger of the area of effect on that, but it's slow to cast, it's very imprecise, it's lower damage, and it only leaves a little cloud. Is armor piercing, but 15 damage compared to our 24 damage. So there's really no reason that you'd want to be falling firing when you could be liquid flaming. So very, very good spell. Definitely a consideration for an early research target. Maybe you go Conjuration 3, Evo 5, and try to use that to do an early war on somebody who's not ready with Fire Resist. Fire Resist is going to be your bane because you you basically you have fire magic. That is what you're good at. Uh, we do have a little bit of Astral, but it's only Astral 1. Like, you're going to have to commune up to do anything of use with that. We also have some Blood Magic, which we will talk about in a minute, but... Fire magic is our main combat magic. Finally, we have one more national spell. We have an enchantment five, inner furnace, three fire and only requires one gem, so very cheap. Basically what this does is all of our units have their heat aura increased. This was a game winning spell, if not countered in Dominions five. Now because of the changes to the way heat auras work, it's a good spell. If you have it, I would cast it, however, you're, you're not going to win just off of this, unfortunately. I, I do want to take a second here because we are so fire focused, just to kind of ping in a couple spells that you should think about for this nation, because you, you need to use your fire efficiently to win, to win battles. If, you're, if your infantry are not doing it anymore, 
you're in trouble because all you have is fire, essentially. So Phoenix Pyre has been talked about a few times. Very key spell for us. We also can easily spam out lesser fire elementals or go up to Conjuration 5 for full fire elementals. However, if you're already getting countered on your fire, fire elementals are not going to do overly much because they're going to rely on fire damage. Uh, another new spell is Nest of Salamanders. Only two fire and one gem. It gives you 10 plus of these little like uh, fire snakes. I believe they're size one or two. Great for just throwing out chaff. You could have your cheap fire mages with a couple gems to throw a few of these out at the beginning of combat just to flood the field with some extra bodies. Uh, they could mix in with your sacreds. Uh, they do have a really nice, um, it's like a fire poison that's, that's quite damaging. So they're pretty darn useful. In alteration, if you do go up for hellscape, which can be very key for you, there's some other interesting things. If you looked into that astral, uh, you could do Solar Eclipse, which basically adds darkness to the battlefield, but it's Fire Astral instead of Death or Glamour. We have that partial Dark Vision, so this will probably hurt the enemy more than it will hurt you. That's kind of a sneaky one. I don't think a lot of people would expect that, so that could be pretty handy. You also get your Cold Resistances here. Very good there. The offensive spells less useful. We have Distilled Gold if you get into a money problem. You also get uh, Phoenix Pyre, which could help keep your mages alive if they're getting attacked. For us, probably not going to happen because we have a good front line, though. In Evocation, I think we covered that pretty well here. Uh, Fires from Afar is a ranged attack spell that we can cast natively. It basically get, makes 20 fire bolts hit random units in a, in a province. So if you had three or four guys do this to an army, to soften them up before you attack. Maybe you'd get lucky and kill some commanders or archers or something. Can be pretty handy. In construction, we have jars of fire, we have sanguine dowsing rods, and we have fire boosters. All good things to get. Construction 5 is pretty key for us. You probably will want that at some point. In enchantment, we have our own fire resist spells. If you're bringing non abyssian troops, you might need that to keep them alive. We also have Heat from Hell. This is a battlefield-wide uh, extra heat. Everyone just has more heat, so more fatigue on top of that. So if you're not getting countered for heat stuff, this can definitely be worth doing. You'll just fatigue people to death, while your troops don't mind at all and continu can continue fighting. We also have Eternal Pyre here. This is the gem generating one, and it also increases the temperature, although in your capital, you're probably already at heat five anyways, because you have a sight raising your heat. In Thaumaturgy, we have the attack buff spells. Not too great, because our troops are good enough without those, but they could, could be useful. Oh, jumping back over to Evocation. Uh, I, I've mentioned this spell a couple times, but we have Second Sun. Requires eight fire, so you're going to probably have to do some empowering, unless you went really high fire on your god for some reason. But Second Sun is kind of a I want to win the game spell. Increases the heat scales in the entire world. Uh, caves are somewhat less affected, but that just means that that's going to hurt everyone else way more than you. Provinces will become hotter and drier every turn until this is taken down. So it can be quite, quite powerful. As for blood magic, there's a few things of note here. There's some blood fire cross paths, but we don't really have much access to that. The big one is that Infernal Breeding. The Infernal Breeding is very, very good. Those units are so nice, and 25 is nothing once you get up and rolling. You probably will need to find some sort of indies to be your patrol units, because our units are expensive enough that you don't want to just be patrolling with those. You want them out and fighting, but otherwise quite good. Uh, Binding Devils, Devils are good units. If you go up to Blood Magic 4, like I did in this game, and you have some nature on your god, you could do some Blood Fecundity, which raises the growth by plus 2 in a province. I did that in my capital, just to ease off the pop kill, but in all honesty, I didn't need it. I, I don't think it was that big of a deal. You could go up to even bigger things here. Uh, Bloodlust is a combat spell that gives demons, I believe, plus 4 strength. So those crossbreeding things that you're doing, any other demons that you've summoned in would get that. Could be quite good. There's also Harm, 
which is a quite powerful spell. It just gives you a chest wound if it hits you. That is pretty dang nasty. You could Blood Rain, which all enemies get frightened up to minus five morale. And that's totally doable. Like three blood, you could empower somebody or you could just do a little Sabbath to get there. Very doable. Very, very doable. Ritual of the Five Gates brings in some special demons. Lots of good blood things here. Of, of particular note, we are able to get someone easily to blood two, astral two, so we can call lesser horror. These summon horrors in on the battlefield, which are very, very nasty. However, they can start attacking you also. So just be be aware that if you're starting to horror spam, you're probably going to end up horror marked and you're going to end up having to fight those. But in a major battle that is like pivotal to your victory, maybe you have you go all out and you just start summoning those. With some work, you also could get up to Send Lesser Horror, which is the range ritual version. Can also be very strong to just start pelting somebody's capital or something with this if you can get in range. Okay, so bringing it all together, we have relatively inexpensive troops that do require a lot of resources. We have a good flyer unit. We have kind of a, a special forces AOE attacker. We have a good sacred that is very usable. We have fire mages that are good at fire magic. We have a very efficient blood hunter that can get astral. So we have a lot of options here, but you're not going to surprise anybody. Abyssia does what Abyssia does. So you need to be decisive and try to like get an early game advantage so that that can carry on and you can snowball that. If you fall behind and people start bringing out counters, and one of the nastiest counters to Abyssia is just an Evo 3 rain. This will make it where we'll take way more fatigue for casting fire spells. It will help put out all of our fire clouds. It'll help put people that are on fire out. Uh, it, it will make our flyers take extra fatigue. This is a very good spell to use against Abyssia. And if you have water access at all and you're fighting Abyssia, you should be using this spell because they will feel it. That will be very noticeable when that spell goes up. Otherwise, another good one is Worgen Winter. Again, you could just use this ahead of your army to lower those heat scales as you're fighting into Abyssia. So something that you could use to counter them pretty effectively. As for Pretender God, I think you have many, many choices. Of my test games, this is kind of the one I think I enjoyed the most. Uh, this is a great Warlock chassis. He's very inexpensive. He only costs 80 points for us. And he comes in with a high Adept crossbreeder. So he was the unit I was using for my Infernal crossbreeding, which I quite enjoyed. Uh, for a Bless, because we can already only fit one Sacred in a square anyways, Larger is just very efficient for extra stats. Extra HP, extra strength. We don't care about defense anyways. We start with three, so doesn't matter. The map move won't matter much because most of our units are pretty darn slow to start with. But Larger is definitely viable here. Stygian Flesh, I think, is kind of a sneaky one. Uh, our Burning Ones with Stygian Flesh go up to Protection 24. A lot of troops will not be able to damage a 24 Protection unit. If they're running Magic Weapons, you still fall back to a 20... No, to a, I think, 18 Protection unit. So, still very solid. Uh, Stygian Flesh also helps our Fire Mages, who have zero protection, go up to 10 which keeps them pretty safe from random arrows or some birds or an imp or something. So again, very good there. And Blood Surge is just a very efficient, very cheap for the stats. Our Sacreds are already going to get kills without it. And once they get Berserk plus Blood Surge, they're just going to be blenders. And you have very low attack density because you're going to have one per square or maybe one plus one troop. So you want to be getting kills if you hit. And this will just help them do that more. It also applies to our fire casters. If they get a kill, they'll start getting that reinvigoration, which they would quite like. And the extra defense I don't know, could, could do something for a mage. For scales on him, I actually went turmoil. Generally, I like to go order if I'm going to do blood hunting to help bring down the unrest that that's going to cause and the, the 
pop kill that, it, that patrolling that unrest down is going to do. But this is kind of a nation that we are we are burning the candle from both sides. So two turmoil, two productions so that we can afford units. I do feel like you, two productions required. And we, there's even a chassis that you could go up to three production would not be a miss. I went straight up to, to fire four. We have units that need to have firepower or can have firepower to be more uh, strong. And a lot of nations are going to hate fighting in fire four. And this will just help us keep things hot for ourselves. We have a build, uh, a starting site in our capital that's going to raise it up to fire five anyways. Our forts help protect us from that fire, so it will lower it down some. We're less affected by death, so I just went all in on that. And because we want a lot of research, but we struggle to get it, we would love to find an efficient indie researcher, if at all possible. I went with Magic 2. Not only does that give us extra research on our kind of junky researchers, I believe that takes Warlocks up to 9, which still isn't great, but it's something. Uh, it lowers Magic Resist, and if you do do Astral or Blood things, a lot of those are Magic uh, Resist negates, so this will just help that. So you can really, really make it exceedingly painful to attack into you as Abyssia, which if you end up on the back foot, you may end up fighting in your own dominion. Remember, you do have blood sacrifices, so you can push that out and make sure that you keep it. So you can almost guarantee that you fight in your own dominion if you are so inclined. Uh, otherwise, I went with just some variety things here. I could go with summon cave cobbles for extra resources, which I didn't in this game, but I could have. Uh, I started in the cave, so they would actually work down there. Uh, I went with the extra nature because I wanted to do uh, blood fecund on my capital. Wasn't really needed, but it's a little fringe bonus. I went with a little bit of water so I could site search for that. And I went with earth so that not only we could get the larger, but I could do dwarven hammers. We only have earth one as our highest, and we're going to struggle to make hammers and boots if you don't bring that in on your god. So I quite like this guy. I quite like this bless. This is definitely not the only bless you could do. I did test a same chassis, but this guy went with Quickness. Quickness Enchanted Blood Blood Surge. So he was dormant because I had to have a little bit of scales, but I was perfectly fine before he came out, and Quickness will make your Burning Ones go insane. However, they will tire themselves out very, very, very quickly. And the, the water otherwise doesn't do anything for us, so I didn't like this one quite as much, but very usable. Very, very, very usable. This was the version I tried before the larger. So I got into the Stygian Flesh and noticed how high the protection got. And on this one, we went with Enchanted Blood. I do tend to see Abyssians bleeding a lot. I think it's because you don't die to hits that will let things proc a bleed. Whereas other units die before they start bleeding, so it doesn't matter. So that was, that was nice for the Burning Ones not to have that issue. And just to have a little bit of regen. Is, is always nice. So very good there. As for other chassis, you have a good smattering of different things. This is that guy that I keep using because he's just so dirt cheap. 80 points gives us the maximum amount of points that we can spend on blesses and scales, etc, etc. You also could get the Freak Lord if you really like crossbreeding. He is a better crossbreeder, but I don't know if 20 points is worth that. Maybe. Maybe you just rush blood really, really hard. Um, could, could be something you could do. You do have a chassis up here, the Netter of Crafts, that raises your production scale limit, so you could go up to three production. I think that would be viable. Uh, you could do maybe some crystal gear crafting with him. He does have a forge bonus, so you could make him your number one crafter and really lean into that. I think that your you have a little bit of thugging ability, even if I don't think it's super efficient. But maybe make your commanders into light thugs. Like you could give them a shield, uh, an AOE weapon of some sort. And that would probably be good enough for them. They could go off and run in with that. Um, I don't think we're a nation that really needs an awake to help us expand because our troops can do it just fine. Even in, in hard scenarios, you can do it. So I would probably lean away from most of the Dom 2 things. But... Yeah, I think you're very flexible. Your troops are good enough. Your mages are good enough. You don't require anything specific. Maybe maybe you just don't even need the bless. Maybe you just go for something something else for other magic uh, accessibility or 
you take something crazy like this guy and give him like b flying burning ones or something or this one over here and you could lean into high high research on it and maybe you do like an awake researcher with ethereal that would be pretty nasty on those burning ones and you could have a turmoil two luck three magic three uh really lean into the adept researcher and the uh inspiring researcher would help you out quite a lot fortune teller to just ensure that you don't get the bad events from your turmoil that could be pretty interesting i i could see that that'd be usable um yeah so i think you have plenty of options here don't feel just because this is my favorite that you need to use it the blood fountain also could be a, a usable thing in your capital he's very good at blood searching so if you're going to blood hunt your cap right from the beginning of the game and then use a warlock to cast your infernal because they do have the adept researcher or excuse me the uh, adept uh, crossbreeder even if it's a little bit lower i think that could be quite interesting you could even maybe like rush blood three and then help your expansion parties with those troops could, could be interesting if you're just going a big earth thing, maybe you could go with one of these guys, the God Block, relatively cheap. Not too bad. It just go with a big earth bless of like fortitude or something. So plenty of room here to play around and try out different blesses. And I, I think that you could be very happy with almost anything. Uh, again, though, I don't think they need the Awake Expanders. I would probably avoid those. Uh, also remember that the scales changes don't stack, so this won't let you go to death four. So that would not work, nor would this let you go up beyond heat four. So keep that in mind there. So overall, very interested to hear uh, other people's thoughts on Abyssia. A fun nation, like I said, it's kind of my comfort food of nations when I just want to play something fun that you can kind of play on cruise control, but they do have lots of cool tricks too. So curious to see what other people like about them. Uh, if somebody has some crazy buff that they've tried out maybe like levitate or something or uh, weightlessness excuse me uh on the burning ones or, or something just crazy to go with but cool nation very cool nation i look forward to seeing people in the stream i think where it's going to be a hot one and i think people are going to enjoy it so leave your comments and thoughts down in the co in the comment section and if you've enjoyed this video, a like helps other people get recommended on YouTube. And hey, if you made it this far, I think I've earned your subscription. and I'd appreciate that. Otherwise, take care, builders, and I will see you on stream.